body. Here we are, Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Praise the Lord, a Sunday. Why? Because we can all join together and sing unto the Lord. Now the Bible says, sing unto the Lord a new song. Why don't you dare today to sing and then just allow your hearts to be open and just allow the Holy Spirit who's alive and very well in you, allow him to rise up and stir you into deeper depths of the ability that you have. And that is to love and to express your love to the Lord and to worship him and just to be free in his presence. So join with me now as we just sing and uh, love the Lord together and be blessed in the wonderful name of Jesus. Because you're about to work a miracle.
Can you believe that? That God's given you the ability in the, the, the realm of the tangible to be able to work a miracle. Because trust me and try me, the Lord's saying here in Malachi chapter 3. I know we all know these scriptures, but you need to hear them today. I need to read them. I need to hear them today. Because we have to exercise our faith. Faith without works is dead. And uh, what the Lord's saying here is, Try me now if I will not open for you the windows of heaven. Wow, why do we have to worry about this? Why do we have to think too hard? God wants to open the windows. What does that mean? If you open the windows, something's going to flow out. That's what it means. Either air's going to flow in or older air's going to flow out. There's going to be a refreshing one way or the other. But the whole thing is, if you open up, and allow the Lord to move, he will move. Another translation says this, I will open the sluice gates. So that's like a dam or a weir, and there's this gate holding the water back. But as we tithe and as we give in faith, it's like the Lord says, I'm opening up and letting it all come out for you. You need to see the picture. God wants us blessed. He wants you blessed. So as you... Press the buttons and transfer the funds. Do it in faith. Speak over those exercises as you sit down and type in what you want to type in there. The thousands and thousands of dollars. Realise, bang, it's not just an action. It's a work of faith. And treat it as you giving unto the Lord your tithe and your offering. Amen? Amen.
Good morning, church. Welcome to our online service once again. Hope you are really experienced the tangible presence of the Lord in your homes this morning. So it's an interesting point that um, even though we can't gather together as people, it does not mean that we do not experience and cannot experience the presence of the Holy Spirit during these moments, during our lives. And as good as gathering together as a church is, as a body, we can still experience the glory of God, whether it's through this meeting online, whether it's through, through our own prayer life, we can still experience and really should be still experiencing the presence of the Holy Spirit in our day-to-day -day walk with our Heavenly Father. And that's what I want to touch on this morning. I want to talk about how the testimony of the Lord and the experience of the Lord. And I'm going to be looking at John chapter 4 and specifically at verse 39 to 42. But the backdrop to this story is about the woman at the well and this is the woman at the well who has this encounter with Jesus and the premise of the story goes that Jesus knew who this woman was even though Jesus didn't know who she was and Jesus was able to tell her everything that she'd done in the context of this story it was that she'd had five husbands and now she was with someone that wasn't her husband and so he was able to relay information that really only she would know. And she recognized that he could be the Messiah. And so the woman who's a Samaritan woman, she's a Gentile. This is a great encounter that Jesus has with the Gentiles. And she goes back into the city to tell all her friends about come and see the Messiah. Could this be the one? Could this be the savior of the world that we've been waiting for? And I want to just read to you the response that, that the people gave her when they came to see who this Jesus was. And this is in John 4, 39 and 42. And it says this, And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him, believed in Jesus, because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them. And Jesus stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of what you said. For we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Saviour of the world. And I read this last Saturday morning. And it really jumped out at me because there is an absolutely wonderful power in testimony. And my beautiful wife is going to be preaching next week. She's going to be preaching on the power of testimony. And that's not what, what I'm going to focus on today because she didn't know what I was going to preach on. And I didn't know what she was going to preach on. But we're actually preaching on exactly the same scripture. And so the Lord is really going to drive across a point today and, and next week as well. What I want you to see in verse 39... It says, they believed because of the word of the woman who testified. And this is the importance of testifying about the goodness of God and the goodness of Jesus and what Jesus was able to do in my life and what Jesus has done for my mind and done for my soul and that he saved my soul, he healed my body. All, all the great and wonderful things that Jesus does for us or has done for us becomes part of the testimony that we give unto other people. And so it's vitally important. I'm not going to touch on the, the power of testimony because what the Lord has shown to me, when it comes to testimony, that's the first level of believing. Because I believed essentially because someone very likely, or you believed because someone testified to you about the goodness of God. Someone testified to you about the salvation of Jesus Christ. The, the scriptures say, how can anyone hear without a preacher? Or how, with that, how will they hear if no one is able to testify and proclaim the goodness of God? And so most people will receive their salvation experience because of the power and boldness of someone being able to testify of the goodness of God. But what I've seen in this scripture, because that's I mean, what I call testimony, is a doorway into the experience of kingdom living. If you look in verse 42, and this is what I found really interesting. And they said to the woman, now we believe, 
not because of what you said. For we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Saviour of the world. Now in verse 39 it says, we believe because of your testimony. And in two verses later, they turn around and say, we no longer believe because of what you said. We believe because we have heard the word of Christ for ourselves. And this is what I really want to drive home and try to get across to you today. The, the salvation experience that you receive from the testimony of the scripture or the testimony of the preacher or from a friend, however you heard about the goodness of God, is a doorway into a place where you then be able to experience God for yourself. And so the, the, what I'm getting across this morning is that we need to move beyond relying on somebody else's testimony for my salvation. I need to go beyond moving beyond someone else's testimony of healing and receive my own healing. Somebody else's testimony of deliverance and receive my own deliverance. And this is, I find it really fascinating that within two verses, once they had their own experience with the, with the Christ, their, their, the whole mindset changed because they had this face-to-face -face encounter with the Lord Jesus. And then it wasn't the testimony of the woman that became the foundation of their faith. It was Jesus Christ himself and their experience with him, which then became the testimony of the, the foundation of their faith. Remember, Jesus said, he who hears my words and does them, he's a wise man who builds his house on the rock. And so what these men and these women have done have moved beyond testimony, which again is not taking anything away from that, but it's actually moving them to build their life on experiences that they've had personally with a saviour. And that's a great challenge for every person who would let believe. What are you standing on for your belief? Are you saved because of some, what someone else said? Or are you outliving your salvation experience in the presence of God because of the experience that you've had with your Heavenly Father, with a risen Saviour, with an outpouring of the Holy Spirit? And this is a, really a great question that we need to ask ourselves. Is your salvation based off someone else's testimony? Or is it truly based off the testimony of Jesus Christ and your experience with him, where he has filled you, overflowed you, and you know that no matter what happens in this life, you cannot deny the experience that you've had with the risen Christ, the one who lives, the one that separates belief systems, because we are really the only people who believe in a God who lives. And we, you look throughout all the scripture, and there's experience upon experience upon experience. And people really were dramatically changed, not just because they heard someone bring a teaching, but it's because they experienced the power of God. And we can see this in Luke 8, 43 to 48. And this, it's a very familiar story with the woman with the issue of blood. She experienced Christ's power. And I just want to quickly show you some of the words that it says in the Passion Translation. This is Luke chapter 8, 43 to 48. In the crowd that day was a woman who suffered greatly for 12 years from slow bleeding. Even though she had spent all that she had on healers, she was still suffering. Pressing in through the crowd, she came up behind Jesus and touched the tassel of his prayer shawl Instantly her bleeding stopped and she was healed. Jesus, said, Jesus suddenly stopped and said to his disciples, Someone touched me. Who is it? While all denied it, Peter pointed out, Master, everyone is touching you, trying to get close to you. The crowds are so thick, we can't walk through all these people without being jostled. Jesus replied, yes, but I felt power surge through me. Someone touched me to be healed and they received their healing. And when the woman realized that she couldn't hide any longer, she came and fell at Jesus' feet before the entire crowd. She declared, I was desperate to touch you, Jesus. Listen to the wording. I was desperate to touch you, Jesus. For I knew if I could even just touch even the fringe of your robe, I would be healed. 
And Jesus responded, Beloved daughter, your faith in me has released your healing. And may you go with my peace. Just the, the wonderful wording it just has in Passion Translation. Master, Peter said, everyone is touching you and trying to get close to you. The crowds are so thick, we can't walk through all these people without being jostled. And this is a really significant point, is that the crowd here is jostling around Jesus. Everyone's just trying to get around him and jostle him and experience the hype of Jesus. But even the, the scripture itself says they're all jostling, but no one's drawing. And so there's two, there's two points within this. It's one thing to touch Jesus. It's another thing when Jesus touches you. Because the, the woman drew the power out of him. So Jesus was touching her. The presence, the anointing, the, the wonderful Holy Spirit flowing through Jesus touched this woman. But the, it's one thing to jostle for Jesus. It's another thing to be desperate for Jesus. And this is the experience. It is the experience of her desperation to draw the power of the risen Christ which changed her life. And we need to challenge ourselves, especially in this time where we can't get out, we can't meet together, everything is different. And you know what? God, in, throughout history, seems to show up in the greatest when things are at their worst. So this is not a time to get down. This is a time to be excited because you never know what the Lord is going to do here. But going back to the point, ask ourselves, are we jostling for Jesus? Or are we desperate to draw on his power and his anointing and his presence and his peace and his righteousness and his life? And it is the desperation for his life which creates the experience. We see it even with Zacchaeus. In Luke 19, verse 1, Zacchaeus talks about him being a man of short stature. He was just trying to get a glimpse of Jesus. He did something really strange to go ahead of Jesus and climb up a tree. So he did a desperate thing to get to meet and encounter Christ. And Christ came to him, came to the tree, and Jesus ended up having dinner at the sinner's house. Why? Because he was prepared to break out of the normal to experience the Saviour. And this time, even though it can be hard that we can't gather together and do things as we normally do, it can be a good thing because if it breaks your mould, so you have to find a different avenue to experience a risen God, that's a blessing. And so if you have to do things differently than what you normally do to experience the presence of God, praise Him. Praise the Lord for him revealing things to be able to have a deeper experience with the Holy Spirit. And if we could even look at, um, it's interesting with Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus' main focus was on encountering Jesus. And yet it was the Pharisees that snickered about Jesus and his word and his teaching and his company. And they experienced nothing. So Jesus, uh, Zacchaeus was focused on Jesus and Jesus alone, while all these other people are, are complaining about Jesus, being annoyed about Jesus, trying to trip him up, trying to argue about the word. Well, I don't know about the word says this and the word does that. And then they start arguing about different doctrines and they do nothing for themselves while all the while Zacchaeus is just waiting in the right place at the right time and Jesus comes to the one who is waiting for him as opposed to all the people who are bickering about the word. So again, we challenge ourselves. Where, where are we at in this place? Are we snickering about the word or are we desperate to get to the risen word? I spoke about it last time, the resurrected word of God. And you know, millions of people over thousands of years has, are still wondering if the Holy Spirit is for today. If he's, a, if he's a real present Holy Spirit, is the baptism of the Holy Spirit for today, for today? Is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit for today? And there's a millions of people that are still arguing about it, but there are also millions of us who are experiencing. So we experience the presence of the Holy Spirit and there is no argument about who he is. 
So it, it depends what your, your, your vision is and what um, lenses you have over your face as to how you see him. If you think Holy Spirit is not someone who is relevant for today, get ready for a boring kingdom life. But the Holy Spirit is the one whom we truly have the experience with because he is the one that connects us to Jesus and Jesus is the one that connects us to the Heavenly Father. And so there is no true God experience without the Holy Spirit. And that's what I'm saying, what I said earlier, just because we're not gathering together naturally and physically as a people doesn't mean the presence of glory of God can't show up in your lounge room. This is how normal church should be. Where the glory of God is filling your house, where the presence and the peace of the Lord is overflowing your life as an individual in your marriage and as a family and your children, not to say everything's going to be perfect, but the Holy Spirit is to be encountered anytime, anywhere, any place. But we have to, are we desperate for him? Are we prepared to go out of the normal ways of our living to encounter him? You know, Jesus said in that story when he's talking to the woman of the well, I will give unto you waters, living waters, living waters, living waters, living waters. And if you drink of the waters that I have, you will never thirst again. You will never thirst again. And what waters was he talking about when he said, how can I drink of this water and never thirst? And we find the answer in Acts chapter 2, and I'm going to wrap up on this point. I'm nearly finished, just a couple of minutes to go. And this is the day of Pentecost, probably one of really the most exciting experience of the New Testament. In chapter 2, verse 37, actually I'll go back. At chapter 2, verse 1. And on the day of Pentecost was being fulfilled, all the disciples were gathered in one place, and suddenly they heard the sound of a violent blast of wind rushing into the house from out of the heavenly realm. And the roar of the wind was so overpowering, it was all anyone could bear. And then all, all at once, a pillar of fire appeared before their eyes. And it separated into tongues of fire that engulfed each one of them. And they were all filled and equipped with the Holy Spirit and were inspired to speak in tongues, empowered by the Spirit to speak in languages they had not learned. And they, so they've had this encounter. The church was birthed through an encounter with the Holy Ghost. This is when the true church started. There was no true preaching. Jesus had died. Jesus had been resurrected and gone to heaven. And there had been this downtime of 50 days of Pentecost. And it was the Holy Ghost which ended up coming in. And they had this experience. It wasn't just the disciples. It was everyone in the upper room. Men, women, apostles or not apostles. They all were filled and empowered with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke in other tongues. And because the Holy Spirit had come upon them and started to flow through them. It turned their world upside down. When it says filled with the Holy Spirit. The Greek word means to fill completely. Or to be filled. And remember that the scripture says that the Lord does not give the Holy Spirit in measure. He's a mighty, mighty force that comes in to a believer's life. And let me just finish on this point with Peter. Because if you remember Peter, Peter's the one that um, denied Jesus three times. Peter was the one always going up and down. It was Peter who was always tripping over his own tongue and his own thoughts and his own attitudes. And he still didn't know what was going on. But it was Peter after Pentecost who stood up and gave the first sermon. Because all the crowd was wondering what was going on. And so Peter stood up in the crowd. And I'm going to finish on this. Je Peter said, this is the fulfillment of what was prophesied through the prophet Joel. For God says, this is what I will do in the last days. I will pour out my spirit on everybody and cause your sons and daughters to prophesy. 
And your young men will see visions and your old men will experience dreams from God. The Holy Spirit will come upon all my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. And I will reveal startling signs and wonders in the sky above and mighty miracles on the earth below. Blood and fire and pillars of clouds will appear, for the sun will be turned dark and the moon blood red before the great and awesome appearance of the Lord. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. First point, for this is what I will do in the last days. This was preached at the day of Pentecost. It has been the last days since Pentecost. It's been the last days for 2,000 years. So yes, we're in the last days, but it was the last days 2,000 years ago as well. But the main point I want you to get is this. I will pour out my spirit on everybody. On your sons, your daughters, your servants, your maidservants. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. The point is this. The kingdom walk is not meant to be some boring walk. It is a walk empowered by the Holy Spirit himself, who shall reveal unto you all things, who he reveals to you because he is the spirit of truth and says he will lead you and guide you into all truth. So while you've got this downtime, some of you have downtime while we're stuck at home, while things are abnormal to what we're normally doing, my challenge to us this morning, how desperate are you for the presence and experience of God in your life? And do you need to move beyond having your salvation built on someone else's testimony and now you can start experiencing the risen Christ and his Holy Spirit for yourself? So, Father, in the name of Jesus, as people are watching, as, as they're listening, I pray that I pray that I'd have ears to hear. And Holy Spirit, that you'd just go in and manifest your glory in a way that they've never experienced before. May your tangible presence be known. May the experience that they have take them into a deeper relationship and a deeper fellowship with you. Just like in the day of Pentecost, when you poured out your spirit, you are still pouring out your spirit on all flesh, on those who are willing to receive and desire something more than what they have in this life. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are faithful to your word and that your presence and your glory fill every person and every home and every family in Jesus' name. Bless you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ.